no, we can finally start module two. So this part says, solve the equation five sec theta minus two sec square theta is equal to tan square theta minus one. Now, I'm not going to be solving that equation. I know that tan square theta plus one is equal to six square theta. Since I have six theta here and six square theta here, I know that tan square theta is equal to six square theta minus one. So I'm gonna substitute this identity. That tan square theta is equal to six square theta minus one. I'm gonna plug that identity for tan square here. So this equation is going to become five sec theta minus two sec square theta. And then tan square theta is now, remember tan square theta is six square theta minus one. So this is gonna work out to be equal to six square theta minus two. We're gonna get six square theta minus two. So pretty much we're gonna have a quadratic in sec theta. So I'm gonna bring everything to one side. Let's bring everything to this side, add two. So I'm gonna have zero is equal to, bringing over here, I get three sec square. I get three sec square theta. I bring over the five over here to get minus five sec theta. Three sec square theta minus five sec theta minus two. Now some persons might prefer to let maybe y equal sec theta. This depends on how you prefer to solve it. Some persons might prefer to just solve it normally, but if you want, you can call y sec theta. And if you call y sec theta, you end up with a quadratic being three y square minus five y minus two, and this is going to be equal to zero. <clears throat> nice. So now you can go ahead and solve this by factorizing. If it can be factorized, let's see. We know it is three y and y. We know it is two and one. Signs are different. And so the bigger one is negative. So I put minus here and I put a plus here. Cool. So what that means we end up solving is, this means that y is equal to minus one over three. And this means that y is equal to two. But remember, what was y? Y is sec theta. So I can say sec theta, let me erase this y then and write sec theta equal to, this is really telling us that sec theta is equal to two. And over here, this is really telling us that sec theta equal minus one over three. Now you just have to remember that sec theta is one over cos. So this is really telling me then that this implies cos theta this is telling me then that cos theta is equal to minus three. And if cos theta is minus three, this has no solution. This is not valid. So you can say that part has no solution. Cos theta cannot be minus three, no solution. But you have to remember that the cosine of any angle X, it is between one and negative one, inclusive, inclusive of one and negative one. 
So you can tell them that. And so really and truly, we'll just be focusing on, we'll just be focusing on this part. If sec theta is equal to two, then the cos of theta is equal to a half. Cos of theta is equal to a half. And if the cos of theta is equal to half, I want you to draw your circle, always draw your circle. And you want where cos is positive. Cos is positive in the first and the fourth quadrant. So first find out what is cos inverse of a half. That will give you the angle in the first quadrant. So cos inverse of a half, that's pi by three. This is pi by three. I by three. And then you can just two pi minus pi by three for the angle in the fourth quadrant. So two pi minus your pi by three. Well, this one will be outside the range. And so what we're getting is theta is equal to pi by three. That is theta. That's because the angle in the fourth quadrant is going to be bigger than pi. It's going to be bigger than pi. So we get theta is equal to pi by three. Now that will give us a solution that's between zero and zero and pi. Now let, what about going backwards? If we were to go backwards, let's subtract two pi and see. If we have pi by three and we subtract two pi, Okay, so that wouldn't be in the solution either. And we have two pi minus pi by three, <laughs> minus two pi. And so pi by three is the answer and minus pi by three will also fit it. And you're wondering why minus pi by three Minus pi by three will fall in the range. We have to look right here. So minus pi by three will also fit this description. So theta is pi by three or minus pi by three. All right, nice. Theta is pi by three or minus pi by three. Moving along, again, we're gonna have to rotate this twice, these pictures like this. Let's rotate this. So it says f of x is equal to cos x plus two sine x. Express f in the form r sine theta plus alpha. So let's go ahead and do that. Express f in the form r sine x plus alpha. So first we have to find what is r r is going to be equal to one square plus two square square rooted. And so this is going to be two square is four, four plus one is five. So r is the square root of five. Now, since we want it in the r sign form, this was the trick. What they did was rewrote the order and you should be able to look and notice that this function to be in the R sine form, typically you write the R part first. So it's two sine X plus cos X. All right, that was the trick. So you have to put it this way first. When you put it this way first, so then you get to see that your A is two and your B is one. So that means alpha, which is equal to tan inverse B over A, you're gonna get that alpha is tan inverse of b, which is one, over a, which is two. So alpha is tan inverse of a half. You check that in your calculator. Tan inverse of a half, and you get 0 0.463. So you get 0 0.46. Three. Well, three six. So I'm going to write zero point four six four. All right. So that's alpha. And so what we're finally going to conclude 
we can tell them hence f of x is equal to the square root of five times the sine of x plus alpha, where alpha is 0 0.464. That's what we get. Nice. Moving right along. It says, hence or otherwise, find the general solution. To find the general solution, when you solve it equals zero, since we already have f of x here, let's solve it around here. Hence, let's say you were solving this part being zero now. So you're solving the root five of the sine of x plus 0 0.64, 0 0.464 equal to zero. That's what we're solving, all right? And so if you divide through by root five, what you're actually going to be solving is just the sine of x plus zero point. So we're solving the sine of x plus 0 0.464, that's equal to zero. So this is not what we're solving. And so of course I always say it, and I'm gonna say it again, draw your circle. And the solution that you want, when it's equal to zero, where is sine positive in the first and the second quadrant? So what that is telling us then, is if you're looking at the solution from the first quadrant, sine inverse of zero is zero, and then the solution in the second quadrant is pi. So let's go ahead and write. So what we have is x plus 0 0.6, 0 0.464 is equal to zero, or x plus 0 0.464 is equal to pi. That's what we have. And so we can go ahead and write the general solution. In this case, x will be equal to negative 0 0.464, or in this case, x is equal to pi minus 0 0.464, pi is 3.14 minus 0 0.464, that's 2.67, 2.68, that is x. But then they want the general solution. So the general solution is, oh, the answer is x. <clears throat> so the general solution for x is x is equal to, there are two possibilities. You are getting negative 0 0.464. And then the general solution, make it add plus 2n pi, plus 2n pi. And then the next part of the solution I had was 2.68. And then you add here 2n pi plus 2n pi, nice and easy, soft, no issues at all. So that's what we have. Now it says, hence, determine the minimum value of two over two minus f. Hence, determine the minimum value. So first, you're gonna start with this. f is between, if it's between r and minus r, r is root five. If it's between root five and minus root five. So if it's between root five and minus root five. So what you do now is you're going to say that minus f, and when you divide an inequality, you change the sign. And so minus root f is between root five and minus five. So when you divide two by negative one, you change the sign of the inequality. Yes, man, yes, boy. You change the sign, then you add two to it, 
and say you get two minus f is going to be between, add two to both sides, which is now two plus root five. And then the other side is two minus root five. Nice and easy. And then now you flip it and put two over it. So two over two minus F. Whenever you take a reciprocal, you change the signs again. So it's gonna be less than or equal to two over two minus root five. And it's gonna be greater than or equal to two over two plus root five. Nice, and so now we can tell them that this is the minimum value. The minimum value is this one right here. So the minimum value of f is, you can tell them that the minimum value of f is two over two plus root five. That's that. This takes care of that. Nice and easy, soft. All right, moving right along. It says prove that tan A plus B minus tan A is this formula right here. So now to do this proof, this is a fairly easy proof. I just want to start by saying tan A plus B Always remember that tan is sine over cos. So what we have on our left-hand side is the sine of A plus B over the cos of A plus B, that is tan. So this is what we have. Tan A plus B is sine A plus B over cos of A plus B. Nice, so this is what we start out with. This is our left-hand side. No issues at all. All right, minus, now the tan of A is sine A over cos A. We wanna show that this will work out to be this. So first thing I notice, the denominator that we need to have is cos A times cos B. So I'm just gonna join it as one fraction by taking the LCM, taking the LCM, which is cos A. So I get the denominator already, cos A times the cos of A plus B. By taking the denominator, what I'm getting in the numerator now is the numerator works out to be this into this leaves cos A. So it's going to be cos A times the sine of A plus B. You know, the cos A times the sine of A plus B. And then I have minus, I have minus sine A times the cos of A plus B. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna to need to simplify the numerator. Given that my handwriting is big, I'm going to do it in text so that it fits the page. I know I tend to write a little bit bigger, so we're gonna simplify the numerator. I'll put back our denominator. Our denominator is cos A times the cos of A plus B. Clearly from my handwriting, I won't get to fit the expansion of the compound angles in the numerator. Let's try and text it. Let me see, use the text font, make it smaller. It should work now. Now sine A plus B, I can write this as 
the cos of a times sine a plus b. Remember, sine a plus b is sine a cos b plus cos a sine b. Close that bracket. Minus sine a times, now cos of a plus b is going to be cos a cos b minus sine a sine b. That's what you get. Nice and easy. So let's finish it off now. So again, we write back our denominator. Our denominator is just what we have, which is cos a, cos a, cos a plus b. We almost finished, don't worry. This is very easy. So we're just writing back our denominator and then let's focus on our numerator now. In our numerator, what we have is cos a. So we're gonna have sine a cos a cos b. So in the numerator we have sine of a times the cos of a times the cos of b. And then the cos a times this is gonna become plus now cos a times cos a that becomes cos square a. The one that's gonna be difficult. So let me put it as plus. This part become cos square a sine b. That's what we get right here. Cos square a sine b. And then we're subtracting. When I expand in the sine a, what I'm gonna get is sine a, ah, when you're expanding the minus, I see what happened. Expanding the minus, we get sine a cos a cos b, and then minus and minus become plus, so then it become plus sine square a sine b. Then it's gonna become plus, this is now sine square a, let me put it up here, sine square a, sine square a times the sine of b. That's the sine of b. Now I'm going to underline, look at this, sine a cos a cos b and the minus sine a cos a cos b those cancel each other. So I'm left back with cos square a sine b minus sine square a sine b. I notice I can factor out a sine b, can factor out a sine b, a sine b is in common. When I factor out a sine b, I'm gonna have cos square a minus sine square a. So let's do that. All right, so I have cos square a sine b plus sine square a sine b. So in the numerator, as I'm saying now, the numerator, I am going to factor out sine b, factor out sine b from the numerator, I am left back with cos square a plus sine square a. But cos square a plus sine square a is one. I left back with cos square a, plus sine square A. So we pretty much complete this question. Cos square A plus sine square A. Nice and easy, so, because that part is one. And so we put back our denominator, which is cos A times the cos of A plus B. So this was a very easy proof. Nice and easy, soft. No real trouble in this one. So that part is one. And so that gives you what you're supposed to get. One over your cos A, not one, your sine B, sorry. This part is one. And so this gives you your sine B. 
that gives you your sine b over your cos a times the cos of a b. And so this proves this question. Once you finish your proof, nice. So you're right, which is equal to your right hand side. I know I shouldn't say equal to, I really should say equivalent, but I guess we can work with equal for now. As you can see, is they put equal, but I mean, we really should say equivalent, but you know, that's fine as well. We go to question four. So let's fix this. Question four says a circle with the equation x squared plus y squared minus four y minus five has center C, a straight line with the equation y equal two x plus five intersects at the points A and B, determine the coordinates of C. Determine the coordinates of C, divide this through by negative two, divide this part by negative two. And so the center C is two, two over two, two over two is one. So the center is one, two. And why are they giving us so much space to do that? How many marks they give for that? I can't understand, that shouldn't be any much. All you do is divide the X and the Y by negative two. When you divide negative two by negative two, you get one. And you divide negative four by two, you get two. So that gives you the center. I don't know why they give three marks unless they want us to do it the other way by putting it in the correct form. So let's do it the other way. By completing the square, you would have gotten the x squared minus two x. When you complete the square, you get x minus one square, subtract one. And then the y squared minus four y, when you complete the square, you're gonna get y minus two square. And then you subtract back two square and subtracting back two square is subtracting four minus five is equal to zero. And then finally you finish it off by putting it in the standard form, which is X minus one square plus Y minus two square. Y minus two square. And then you're gonna have minus one minus four is minus five. Minus five minus five is minus 10. So this is equal to 10. All right, so from this now you could tell them that the center is one, two. I guess this is how they wanted it. This would make more sense for three marks instead of just putting this down. That gives you your three marks. Find the points A and B. Let's see if that's what they're saying, because I said it intersect at A and B. All right, I just want to rotate. Let's rotate. It says show that the coordinates of A and B are 0, 5, and minus 2, and that BC is perpendicular to AC. That should be a good amount of marks. Yep. So let's solve for the point of intersection here. So the curve was x squared plus y squared minus two x minus four y minus five. I'm just gonna write down the curve. It was x squared plus y squared minus two x minus four y. minus five equals zero. That was the equation of the curve, which is the circle. And then I think they told us that we're gonna put the line now. So we're gonna sub y equal to, they gave us the equation of the line. I don't remember what the line was, so let's check it. Two x plus five. So 
So we're going to sum y equal to 2x plus 5 into the circle. Sub y equal 2x plus 5 in equation 1. Where this is equation 1. So let's sub it into equation 1. Subbing it in equation 1, we're going to get x squared plus y squared is going to become 2x squared, which is 4x squared, plus twice the product of the two, that's 10x. 10x times 2 is 20x, so that's plus 20x, plus 5 squared. 5 squared is 25. And then you have minus 2x, minus 4y, minus 5, and that's equal to 0. So now what do you do? x squared plus 4x squared is 5x squared. And then you have 20x minus 2x is 18x. Is that so? Let's make sure we're adding them correctly. 20x minus 2x. Yep, that's 18x. And then we have 25 minus five and 25 minus five is 20. This is equal to zero. Signs are the same, both of them positive. Did I write down the curve correctly? Let me go ahead and see what was the curve again. X squared plus Y squared minus 2XY minus 4Y. Oh, I see. I didn't substitute right here what was Y. So my apologies about this. So this is right so far. This is plus 20. Plus 20. Because 20X minus 2X is 18X. 25 minus 5 is 20, but then I need 4y minus 4y. So it's minus 4 times y, and y is 2x plus 5. I know this is equal to 0. I don't know how I left off the y right there. So now we can go ahead. So what we have is 5x squared. Now 18x minus 4 times 2x, that's 10x. That's 5x squared plus 10x. And then 20 minus 5 times, minus 4 times 5 is 20 minus 20, which is 0. So we have 5x squared plus 10x equals 0. We can divide through by 5 now to get x squared plus 2x is equal to 0. And so now we can factorize. Don't even need to factorize, but you can factorize and you're gonna get x times x plus two is equal to zero. And if x times x plus two is equal to zero, then x equals zero or x equal minus two. All right, x equals zero and x equal to minus two. Now that x equals zero, you can plug in x being zero in y to get two times zero plus five is five. And you plug in x being minus two in here and you get y is equal to one. And so of course we showed now that a is the point zero five and B is the point negative two, one. All right. So A is the point zero, five, and B is the point negative two, one. Nice, now that we, we showed A and B, it said show that the line BC is perpendicular to the line AC. 
so that the line BC is perpendicular to the line AC. There are many ways you can show that the lines are perpendicular. If the lines are perpendicular, then that means that vector BC dot, that means their dot product must be zero, then that means vector BC dot vector AC must be zero. All right, I'm only thinking vectors right here, but there are other ways you can do it. All right, so vector BC would mean OC, where OC is the center of the circle. What's OC? OC is center of the circle was one, two. So going around here, OC would be one, two, minus B, OB, what was OB? OB is minus two, one. So this is now one. This was minus two, one. So it's one minus one, two, minus, minus two, one. That will give you vector BC. All of this together is vector BC dot vector AC. Vector AC is OC, which is one, two. Minus vector OA, vector OA would be, that's vector OA. A was a point zero five. Once their dot product is zero, then they're perpendicular. So one minus minus two, one minus minus two is one plus two, so you get three. Two minus one is one, so you get three one dot. One minus zero is one minus zero is zero, and two minus five is minus three. One minus zero is one, my apologies. One minus zero is one. So now when you work out this dot product, you get three minus three, which is equal to zero. So hence, since that since the dot product is zero, we can conclude that they are perpendicular. So we can say, hence, you can tell them that BC is perpendicular to AC. All right. That's one way you could show them that it's perpendicular. Let's show another method or Another way you could show that they're perpendicular is if you find the gradient of BC and you're gonna show that the gradient of BC is a negative reciprocal of the gradient of AC. So the gradient of BC is equal to, <coughs> the gradient of BC is from OC, it's gonna be two minus one over minus two minus one. That's the gradient of BC. That works out to be two minus one is one over minus three. That's the gradient of BC. Then you work out the gradient of AC and the gradient of AC is going to be two minus five over one minus zero let me see, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So we get two minus five, which is minus three. Okay, y2 minus y1 over x2. I put the order of this wrong. This was supposed to be minus, the order of this one is wrong y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, that should be one plus three, one plus two, which works out to be three. And the gradient of AC is minus three. Now, since the product of their gradient is negative one, so you can conclude pretty much that the gradient of AC is equal to negative one over the gradient 
of BC, hence they are perpendicular. So any way you decided to prove it is fine. They could tell them, hence, hence AC is perpendicular to BC. Either way, prove it is fine. All right. I like to always have a sketch of what's going on. So BC was minus two, one, and we have zero, five. I'm just going to show you a sketch of what's going on. I just love to give sketches. I'm just going to show you a small sketch re real quick right here. So you have a circle with center one, two. We have some, the center is one, two. And you have A is the point, this is the center one, two. A is the point zero, five. So zero is over here and five would be somewhere here. This is A, zero, five. We can tell them this is A, which is zero, five. And B was the point, what was B again? B was negative two, one. So B is negative two, one. If this is one, two, <clears throat> negative two, one is going to be somewhere down here. I don't like how I make this look like 12. That's supposed to be a comma to show that the center is one, two, X being one here, so X being zero should be somewhere here. And Y being two here, A is somewhere up here. All right, and the point, what was it was B again? Negative two, one. Negative two, one. So one, Y value of one is beneath here. So if this is two, one could be somewhere here. One could be somewhere here and then negative two is somewhere around here. So of course my circle is not accurate. Maybe be somewhere here, negative two, one. And then all it is saying is that BC, let me try to put in a line BC. All they're telling us is BC, which is this line. They're telling us that it is perpendicular to AC. So maybe A should have been somewhere about here. All right, A should have been somewhere about here. So that's all they're saying. The line AC is perpendicular to BC. That's all they're saying. All right, so this is just a sketch of it. I like to give a schematic so we understand what's happening. All right, this is perpendicular to this. All right, let's move along. Shouldn't be wasting time looking at what's happening. And so now it says, determine the equation of the tangent to the circle at either points, at either, okay, gives us a choice. Let's just do both. Determine the equation of the tangent at either point. Let's do both. So at point A, Let's go with at point A. At point A. At point A, we need to find the gradient of the tangent. At point A, the gradient of the tangent is going to be equal to. Remember, this is at the point A. At point A, 
the gradient of the tangent is going to be this, one over three at A, yeah man. Cause look why, let's show you why. Looking back at our circle, this is at point A. You're gonna find the gradient of the normal first, which is AC. The gradient of the normal AC, but then the tangent is minus one over the gradient of the normal. So the gradient of the tangent is going to be one over three at A. So the gradient of the normal right here is one over three for point A. And so at A, the equation of the tangent is y minus the y value at A, which is five. And that is equal to one over three into x minus zero. That'd be the equation of the tangent at A. So in other words, you bring it over, you get y is equal to one over three x plus five. That's the equation of the tangent at A. So if you did that, you're good. What if you chose B? At B, because remember A, A and B, the lines we showed, they were perpendicular to each other. And so the gradient of the tangent at B is going to be equal to negative three. So the equation of the tangent at B is going to be y minus the y value at B y minus the y value at B and the y value at B was what's the y value at B? 2 y value at B was 1 sorry y value at B was 1 so it's y minus 1 is equal to minus three into x minus minus two, which is x plus two. So the equation of the tangent at B is y is equal to negative three x. And this would have been minus six and minus six and care over the one is minus Five minus six plus one is minus five. So this is a tangent at B. This is a tangent at A. Anyone you do is perfectly fine. Anyone at all. Now, what I always like to do is show a schematic. So looking at this circle, I'm gonna show you a schematic of Y. Always good to look at schematics. All right, so looking at the schematic right here, the tangent at B would be this. Let's use, which color should we use for the tangent at A? Let's use green. The tangent at A would look like this. This is a tangent at A in green. And if I were to insert in the X and Y axis, it's insert the X and Y axis, zero five. Remember A is a point zero five. So that means this is the X axis. And let's put it in the circle on the axis now. This is the Y axis rather. When X is zero, Y is five. Then the X axis is somewhere, let me see. This is one. This point is one, so let me see where I can put X axis. This is when X is, this is when Y is zero, five. X axis would be somewhere here below the center. So I'm just putting on the axis. So we get a good idea of what's going on. So this would be the tangent at A. All right, so you can clearly see that the gradient is positive. It's one over three and it passes into five. But I'm gonna show you the tangent at B. 
the tangent at B, doing that in light blue, this will be the tangent at B. Look, it's cutting the y-axis at negative five. This will be the tangent at B. So I'm showing you why we got those values, negative gradient, tangent at B, positive gradient, tangent at A. It's always good when you can have a good schematic of what's going on. Nice, so this concludes that question. Moving right along. You have to rotate again. All right. So now we're looking at part B, which is vectors, which is the best topic in pure mathematics. So it says the points P, Q, and R are the vertices of a parallelogram. What? Oh, there are three vertices. We know what vertices are. So, you know, if you were to draw a parallelogram, I don't know how the parallelogram is. Just, I know this is poorly shaped, but they're just telling you that there are the three vertices of the parallelogram. I know, that's all they're saying, three. And they say now express PQ and QR in that form. So vector PQ is equal to OQ minus OP. OQ is going to be one minus three is minus two. So PQ is minus two, that's minus two I. Then we have two minus minus one, that's plus three J. Then we have minus four, minus two, that's minus six K. So that would be vector PQ. Next we need is vector QR. Vector QR is going to be vector of the last minus vector of the first. So vector QR is equal to OR minus OQ. So minus one, minus one, that's minus two I. Then we're gonna have one minus two, one minus two is minus I, minus J, sorry, minus J. Then minus two, minus, minus four. Let me check that in the calculator to be safe. Minus two, minus, minus four, that's positive two. This is plus two K, this is vector QI. All right, nice, moving right along. It says, show that the vector S is perpendicular to the plane through P, Q, and R. So if the vector is perpendicular to the plane, then if we find the equation of the plane, we have P, Q, and R, then let's say this is vector S, then this would be S. S is perpendicular to the plane. So if S is perpendicular to the plane, then S can act as a normal to the plane. Let's find out if that is true. So first we're gonna find the normal to the plane. To find the normal to the plane, you can take the cross product of these two. Find the cross product of P, Q, and Q, R. So we have I, J, and K. And so what we're saying then is we have minus two, three, minus six. Then you have minus two, minus one, positive two. Find your cross product now. Uh, let's go ahead. Your cross product will be, so the normal is equal to finding their cross product. We cross here, we cross here. So it's I times the determinant of three minus six minus one, two. Three minus six minus one times two. Minus J times the determinant of, that will be minus two minus six minus two, two. Minus two minus six minus two times two plus k times 
determinant of k times minus two, three minus two minus one, that's minus two, three times minus two minus one. We go ahead and work that out. So we're getting that the normal is equal to three times two is six. So I'm getting six minus six is zero. So I get that this part is zero i. And look now, and so right here, you're getting minus two times two minus minus two times minus six. That's giving me minus 16 and then times the minus one gives me plus 16 j plus 16 j and then here I'm getting minus two here I'm getting minus two minus one minus minus two times three I'm getting plus 8k so I get 16 j plus 8k that's the normal to the plane 16j plus 8k. So what am I saying? So if S is perpendicular to the plane, and let's say this is the normal N, if S is perpendicular to the plane, it must be parallel to the normal. So let's write that down. If S is perpendicular to the plane, then it must be parallel to the normal. Let's check it and see if that is true. So we just found that the normal is equal to zero. The normal is equal to zero, 16, eight. That's the normal. It's equal to zero i plus 16 j plus eight k. That's what we got for the normal. And we can factor out a minus one to write this as minus one times zero minus 16 times minus eight. But guess what? Look, look, look. Minus 16 J minus eight K and I as zero is S. And so the normal is equal to some constant, which is minus one times the vector S. So guess what? Yes, they are indeed parallel. So since the normal to the plane, since the normal to the plane and S are parallel, since the normal to, since the normal to the plane and S are parallel, then we can conclude that S is perpendicular to the plane, perpendicular to the plane. Nice, no issues. It says, hence determine the Cartesian equation of the plane. So the Cartesian equation of the plane is R dot N is equal to any one of these points, let's use P, P dot N. So it's gonna be R dot N, we found that the normal to the plane was H. Or was it 16? I think it was 0, 16, 8. So it's R dot 0, 16, 8. And that's equal to any point on the plane. Let's use the point P. P is, P is, Three minus one, two. Three minus one, two. So P is three minus one, two. And we dot that with N. So three minus one, two dot N. And N is zero, sixteen, eight. Nice and easy. 0, 16, 8. So we work those out now. So what we get is R dot N, this part will work out to be 0x 
plus at 16y plus 8z, 16y plus 8z is equal to three times zero is zero, minus 16 plus 16 is zero, so 16y plus 8z is equal to zero. We can divide through by eight to get two y plus z is equal to zero. So this is the equation of the plane. 2y plus c is equal to zero. That's the equation of the plane. Nice. And tell them soft capital T. All right, we're on to module three. 